So I'm here with uh, Daniel. He's uh, a colleague from CERN. So, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Daniel. Uh, and I'll, I work with uh, Dayan on the machine learning uh, team in the IT department. Cool, and yes. if you'd like to, to connect, for example, on, on LinkedIn, I can paste my, my LinkedIn URL in the, in the chat. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, to the talk. I will join in later in the talk. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Dan. I'm a software engineer at CERN. And uh, today we are going to discuss a little bit about our Kubeflow deployment at CERN and also a particular uh, machine learning use case uh, uh, in high energy physics that uh, Daniel is going to uh, describe in more, more detail. So uh, we will discuss uh, a little bit uh, about CERN, the, the background and the history and the, the uh, goal of the goals of the organization. Then we will uh, discuss machine learning and Kubeflow at CERN. Uh, then we will cover the specific use case and we will see a live demo. And in the end, we will have conclusions and uh, uh, offer our uh, insights to, to the community. So uh, CERN is a particle physics organization uh, with a mission to uh, expand our knowledge of the universe, uh, to um, to understand what the universe is made of and how it works. And it is doing that by studying the subatomic particles. Uh, and for that, uh, we have the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. And uh, it's um, an international collaboration of, of over 17,000 part-time and full-time employees of over 110 uh, nationalities. Uh, so uh, CERN is operating uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and that's the largest particle accelerator in the world. Uh, it is a 27 kilometer ring of superconducting magnets that is located 100 meters underground on the Swiss uh, and French border. Um, the way it works is that there are beams of particles from opposite directions that are accelerated near the speed of light. And then these particles collide at four points, uh, at four detectors. And this is where physicists actually uh, obtain, uh, obtain results. Because during these collisions, uh, the new subatomic particles appear that otherwise don't exist in the nature and cannot be observed otherwise. Um, uh, there, are no, there are no other ways to observe these particles other than to smash other particles at, uh, at the highest possible energies. And uh, that is how uh, uh, the, the presence of Higgs boson was confirmed in 2012. And uh, this is how CERN is, uh, is operating. So here you, you can see some uh, photos from CERN. This is the exhibition building. Here we can see the magnets uh, the, in the caverns. And this is where the beams actually go and then collide at the detectors. And here we can see the detector and uh, we can see the magnitude of the CMS detector uh, and uh, the beam is, um, the, the particles uh, collide here and all this infrastructure and electronics is used to uh, extract uh, information about these collisions. And uh, then data is uh, um, first uh, processed and um, like, uh, uh, processed in a way that in only interesting events are, are stored, and then the data travels to the to the data centers where it's stored and analyzed offline. So a little bit about machine machine learning and Kubeflow at CERN. So uh, in there is a, a large amount of data and uh, at the LHC collisions. There's there are 40 million collisions per second happening at the LHC, which translates to around 90 petabytes of data per year. So there is a potential for machine learning in different stages uh, of the data acquisition. So we can apply uh, some machine learning techniques uh, early on to select which data is interesting. Uh, or we can apply machine learning uh, later to extract some uh, valuable physics uh, results. Uh, and uh, yeah, this amount of data really allows potential for uh, different applications. Uh, so now a little bit about the, the, the actual applications. Uh, I have mentioned the, the selection process. So early in the, after the, the collisions happen, uh, it's, uh, it, 
it's very important to select which events are interesting enough to be stored for further processing and which can be thrown away. Uh, now, this is um, uh, this decision has to be made very fast on the on the FPGAs, and traditionally the analytical algorithms were used that uh, might become slow in the future when we have more data. So it. The, the different applications of machine learning uh, algorithms are researched to be applied very early uh, to that trigger, uh, to that selection process. And we're doing that selection because it's not possible to store all the data um, about every, every collision. The computing infrastructure just does not uh, support it. So that's why this is important. Uh, then in particle tracking and reconstruction, uh, we can also apply machine learning techniques. We can uh, vi visualize the detectors as a 3D as 3D spaces, and then uh, we can uh, basically uh, use that as an input and obtain uh, the ID of the particle and uh, the IDs of the particles that produced that particular collision. Then uh, we have beam calibration. We use some reinforced uh, learning to, to calibrate the, the beam. Uh, then uh, in simulations, there are, uh, there's a lot of research with 3D guns as a faster alternative to Monte Carlo. Uh, with these 3D guns, it's possible to do simulations on the fly. And there's a lot of research at CERN to, um, to actually use more and more these, uh, um, these applications in the, in the future. Uh, then on top of that, uh, we also have uh, different infrastructures such as IT or uh, the, the experiment itself and the, the actual facilities that produce a lot of data. So we can apply machine learning there as well. Uh, for example, we have a machine learning techniques in anomaly detection in our cloud monitoring uh, team. And uh, there's a lot of potential for machine learning there as well. So now, uh, where does Kubeflow uh, fit in here? Um, one of the main challenges at CERN is the, the uh, machine learning infrastructure. So there are various groups, as I have described, uh, that work on machine learning. And uh, the, the main issue is that they all work on local infrastructure, which means one or two or maybe three, four GPUs that they have to set up themselves. They have to install GPUs, they have to install NVIDIA drivers, uh, CUDA, uh, Python libraries, and then to share that across uh, users in the group. So it's a lot of additional uh, maintenance work for researchers, which we would like to avoid in, in a way. So this is uh, how the idea for Kubeflow arose. And uh, we had a couple of requests for from people from different experiments to start experimenting with it. Uh, and uh, we, that is how we deployed our first, our first instance. Our idea is to reduce the maintenance work, uh, to allow easier access to, to GPUs, and to offer scaling capabilities. So to offer scaling capabilities on our own on-premise cluster, and also uh, to the public cloud when, when we have resources for the, the public clouds. Uh, and uh, also we, we can uh, help with uh, uh, going from this uh, testing environment of uh, doing uh, prototyping with Jupyter Notebooks uh, to the full scale training, to the scalable training with multiple GPUs. And users then don't have to move platforms. For example, if they work on their own local platform, then uh, they have to move to, um, to some batch jobs and then do some different uh, syntax. While if they work with Kubeflow and uh, use only one platform, it's not that difficult to, to actually scale their, uh, their workloads, to go from one GPU in the notebook to multiple GPUs with a PyTorch job or a TF job or something like that. So uh, our instance is on-premise. Uh, we are using uh, OpenStack uh, provided uh, virtual machines. So with OpenStack, we get our virtual machines, uh, which serve as uh, Kubernetes nodes. Then on those nodes, we deploy a Kubeflow instance, and that is how we, how we are running it. So um, we are maintaining customized downstream repositories of Kubeflow, uh, Kubeflow pipelines, and uh, the, other, uh, the other repositories that, that we need to customize in a way. And we're doing our GitOps with Argo CD. So, 
Uh, with Argo CD, it's relatively easy to deploy our clusters, and it's also easy for us to uh, deploy our clusters to new, to different cloud providers. So, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, we have some credits at the GCP or AWS or Azure, and then we want an easy way to deploy our Kubeflow instance there, and this is why Argo CD is very handy. Uh, we also provide a integration with many services such as SSO. Uh, we keep our uh, uh, Docker images on uh, our Harbor registry. We use CSI Manila in, for our uh, PVCs. Then we use GitLab CI for automated uh, building of our images. And then we use uh, the EOS file system a lot, which is a network file system where all of, where basically all our uh, researchers are um, storing their data sets. So we're in production since April 2021, and uh, uh, the, the service is getting uh, more and more traction. Um, so here a little bit about that. Uh, users, we're getting very good feedback from our users, and uh, uh, because we offer these scaling capabilities that cannot be found uh, easily in, in local, cannot be done easily in the, the local infrastructures, uh, so essentially, it comes down to the number of GPUs available that, that the, the number of users will uh, eventually scale. Uh, so there are various use cases already running in the cluster, uh, both physics and non-physics non ones. And uh, I can go, I'll go back to, to the Jimmy's um, talk about um, Kubeflow features. Uh, so you might be curious which uh, features are mostly utilized and <laughs> it's actually all of them. So uh, notebooks are utilized uh, a lot because they're uh, the main point of integration where users actually uh, deploy all the other um, CRDs. And in some cases, you, users also use notebooks for, for training. Uh, then we have training operators, Python jobs and the TF jobs mainly to, to train uh, distributedly. Then we have a growing usage of pipelines, and then we have uh, inference services that run in production. And then, of course, we have CATIB for hyperparameter tuning. So I think we have a pretty good balance of uh, what, uh, what our users are utilizing on a, on a daily basis. So that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, our, the, those are just the links to our previous KubeCon talks. If you're more interested uh, to, to have a better look of, on what we did and how we manage our infrastructure. You can have a look there. And uh, I think this is where I stop and Daniel will walk us through a particular physics use case um, developed with Kubeflow. Yeah, sure. Can you stop your screen share and then I can take over? So, exactly like uh, Diane said, I will uh, continue on with the, with the particle physics uh, use case that we have. Um, so, what I've studied is called jet, ener jet energy corrections, uh, and uh, I've used machine learning uh, to do those. Uh, previously, these are uh, done uh, using non-machine non learning methods, and I, I then used uh, graph neural networks to to do this kind of energy calibration. Uh, so I can give a brief intro, introduction on, on what these uh, particle jets are. Uh, so in the Large Hadron Collider, which is on the pictures in, at the beginning of the slideshow, um, protons are uh, collided. And uh, when that happens uh, at very high energy, uh, so-called partons are released, uh, such as quarks and gluons. Um, these particles cannot exist freely in nature due, due to uh, like a principle um, called color confinement in, uh, in physics. And therefore, since they have high energy, they will uh, produce more um, gluons around them and then hadronize into so-called or into color neutral particles uh, called hadrons. Mm, and this will happen in a shower uh, and in the same direction. So what we get is a cone-shaped uh, spray of particles, uh, which we can cluster together uh, into a particle jet. And uh, these particle jets are of interest for, for further physics analysis to see what's really going on in these collisions and 
uh, maybe get some some predictions for the following the standard model of, of particle physics. Um, and this uh, particle jet has an energy that's measured in uh, calorimeters in the detector. And uh, what I've done then is use uh, machine learning um, to, to, to calibrate this energy towards like uh, uh, theory or theoretical simulations. Uh, so yeah. Uh, these uh, jets uh, can re be represented as uh, particle clouds. This is the most natural way where we use the detector, the coordinates of the detector. Uh, as you can see here in the middle picture, we have uh, eight of five uh, coordinates, and we can then, in the rightmost picture, see a jet uh, in this coordinate system. So a jet uh, consists of char charged neutral uh, particles as well as secondary vertices. Uh, these vertices are our interaction points uh, for particle particles interaction interacting in this shower that's created from the collisions and uh, representing particles this way is uh, analogous to point clouds in computer vision uh, so therefore uh, we can then borrow maybe some machine learning methods from computer vision to to do the calibration for uh, this uh, type of uh, data structure so how can we learn on this, uh, this type of, of data? We have uh, particle feature vectors uh, represented here as uh, x1 through uh, x5. And they are a unordered set of, of particles or unordered set of feature vectors. So ideally, we'd then like to map, map these uh, feature vectors towards the theoretical energy value. And f here represents the machine learning uh, model that we use for this. Uh, what it also has to obey is order invariance. So these particles, as I said, are an un unordered set, uh, and therefore the order of these particles as they come in shouldn't matter for the machine learning method uh, when it tries to map towards the target energy. So the first uh, architectures, uh, architecture I've chosen to use is called particle flow network. It borrows from um, a paper from 2017 uh, called Deep Sets from Amazon, uh, where they apply uh, multi-layer perceptrons to, to every uh, member of, of the set. So in this case, every particle feature vector has an MLP applied to it. Uh, and uh, this MLP is then shared am among the members of the set. And importantly here is that when you then aggregate uh, the output from this, uh, uh, this uh, multi-layer perceptron is the aggregation has to be order invariant. So for example, summing is used here and you can see in the blue boxes there on the left, there's a global sum pooling. So summing is a order invariant operation. Uh, other options are mean pooling or maybe max pooling. This can then uh, map uh, uh, these uh, latent features into a global state that's representative for the whole jet, meaning the, all, the, all the members of the sets combined. And then we apply Finally, another multi-layer perceptron towards the energy target. So this is actually the simpler architecture. Uh, the other contender that I also use is called particle net. So here we actually then use a graph. Um, this uh, is then more complicated since we actually use k nearest neighbors. Uh, that's a green box on the uh, upper right of the slide. Uh, you can see that. We use the coordinates, uh, the detector coordinates, to construct the, the k nearest neighbor graph for every single particle. Um, this is a computationally more heavy architecture. Uh, and uh, the advantage of using this architecture is maybe that the locality of the particles towards the other particles surrounding it might be of importance. And uh, we can extract some more, more information. Uh, and uh, these kind of blocks where you construct a graph, uh, use stage features, and pass that through an MLP aggregate as we did before. Uh, this kind of block is called edge convolution. Um, and uh, the, 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 the particles coordinates are updated after it, every edge convolution block such that uh, we use the, the latent features uh, and construct a graph based on that instead. So, after one block, uh, we actually have a highly, highly dimensional um, uh, graph as opposed to just the two dimensions that we used in the beginning. 
And once it has passed through all the edge convolution blocks, we then can do a average or uh, like a order invariant pooling. In this case, I used average pooling uh, to pull to, to a global state and then map that towards the energy target. Now, here's where uh, kubeflow comes in. So I just described the, the deep learning uh, or the, the application and the, the deep learning models that we use or want to use. And uh, we then have kubeflow here to facilitate the training and serving of these models. So we start with running a AutoML experiment using the CATIP component where we train multiple um, or we use uh, like a, a randomly selected uh, parameters to train uh, train this model multiple times to find out maybe which one is the uh, optimal one. Uh, we export the one that performs the best after uh, all the trials have run. Um, this is in, in the PyTorch uh, format and then we um, convert this to Onyx and serve it uh, using KSERV. Um, so the training here is uh, uh, data that's uh, or 40 million jets equals 10 gigabytes and this uh, is then stored in S3. Uh, and as I said, we use uh, the random search algorithm to, to tune the hyperparameter, hyperparameters to find out which, uh, find the lowest possible loss. And uh, Kubeflow has been for the scaling up on Kubeflow is, is fairly fairly straightforward and because we can use the PyTorch job operator. Uh, as Jimmy said, this is now like a unified operator, but uh, for our Kubeflow version, we use the PyTorch uh, job operator uh, to facil facilitate the training on multiple nodes uh, where every node has a GPU. And uh, also in the PyTorch code, uh, we can use multiple CPUs to to read the data, uh, scaling up or uh, speeding up the training even more. And then if that's not enough, you, you can also use multiple CATIP trials in parallel uh, to, to scale up even more. Um, and uh, while this is happening, we can also monitor the training with TensorBoard since we are logging uh, the TensorBoard output uh, to S3 as well. And we have a uh, TensorBoard connected to that uh, in Kubeflow. Uh, and finally, then when we have the found the optimal uh, model for our use case, uh, we export this to Onyx and serve it using uh, the Triton uh, predictor um, or NVIDIA Triton inference server. And uh, this is all, all done then through, through Kubeflow in a pipeline. And uh, when then we can open a, a notebook server on Kubeflow to, to see how well this uh, how well this model is performing. Uh, we have an internal URL that we can query uh, uh, predictions from and, and see how, like uh, all sorts of nice statistics uh, when we use the Triton Python client. And here, here for example, you see on the lower right uh, uh, where we you take inference uh, for a varying batch size of, uh, of input data. Uh, so if you use uh, like a, a batch size of one is, is is really the slowest and then when you increase the batch batch size the the inference happens a bit uh, faster um all right so now i'll do a live demonstration uh, of my uh, the pipeline i've made and uh, let's see so here's the the kubeflow interface uh, inter user interface that we have at, uh, at cern uh, here are a couple of experiments i've run uh, so these are all, all, all pipeline runs, and uh, two uppermost ones are the one once I have uh, then stuck with and, and service and everything. So here's the pipeline. I start with the, the AutoML uh, CATIP experiment. Mm, we can see some uh, some input uh, parameters to this uh, step, uh, as well as output parameters where at the, the optimal model path, for example. And we also played around a bit with the visualizations in, in Kubeflow. So here I visualized the optimal trial. Uh, so it allows for markdown or tables, for example. These are the ones I tried out uh, of the visualization op options in Kubeflow. Um, in this table, you can see then the, the optimal uh, parameters to training uh, found, um, as well as the the loss, different types of loss for this uh, 
uh, optimal trial. Uh, equally, the next step is then uh, PyTorch job that is used to export the mod optimal model from PyTorch format to Onyx format and, and store it on S3 as well. And so here we have uh, different input parameters and uh, the model path for the optimal uh, model that is then stored on S3 in, in Onyx format. And finally, then we, we sort the, the Onyx model. Um, furthermore, I can show you the the first step of the pipeline is then the AutoML one. So here we have, uh, for example, particle net. Um, and this is the, the hyperparameter tuning uh, user interface. So here we can see the different uh, trials. Um, so each uh, trial yields a different loss, a different, or here you can see other metrics such as mean squared error, mean absolute error. And uh, then the corresponding uh, parameters for every run is here on the on the right side. So like uh, k is the number of k nearest neighbor in the graph, and the uh, number of convolutional layer, layers, number of uh, uh, like uh, linear layers as well. And then you can also highlight every run. So to see which one is, if you're interested in a particular one, you can highlight that and see see how well the the parameters compare and which ones uh, perform well and which one doesn't. Also, if you if you log the timestamp uh, as well, then you can have open up some the user interface for the for the metrics that you are uh, interested in as well in this user interface. Um, what else? We have the tensor board here. Um, this is then reads from S3 uh, have logged for all the runs, but the uh, particle flow network and the particle net one, I, I've logged everything to the tensor board. Uh, this lowest one here as well. And uh, here you can see, this is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, like uh, it gives interesting information about the training, uh, very useful uh, tool for, for following along how the training performs. So here you can then see really in depth, uh, compare all the models, uh, see where they start, to, where the loss starts to, to go down, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then finally, we have uh, two models that are then served. So, um, okay, this one is something I served later, but these two, two models are the, the ones uh, I trained and then, uh, it, as you can see, it's a Triton uh, inference server that's used here, and uh, it reads from reads from this uh, S3 bucket. So we can check this out and take the, the URL for this uh, model, uh, copy that, and open a open a a notebook server on uh, Kubeflow. So I will go ahead and paste uh, the URL for this uh, model. I've already loaded uh, a couple of, or a hundred thousand jets here uh, from the test data set uh, with uh, some then features uh, that are used for training. And uh, here I then use the Python Triton client to set up a client that I can request uh, predictions from. And uh, what I will do here is then uh, plot uh, every single jet uh, and the corresponding uh, predictions will be written above the above the plot. So let's see how it goes. All right. So this will then request predictions for uh, 100,000 jets, uh, one at a turn, uh, with a one second delay in between. And as you can see here, particle net uh, predicts uh, transfer momentum value of this magnitude. And on the uh, right side, you see what the true uh, uh, part of, uh, transfer momentum uh, value is, and they are like of the same magnitude. Uh, and uh, the model is indeed uh, doing what it should do. And uh, what we have uh, analyzed also is that it, it uh, outperforms the non-machine learning uh, method, which is very neat and yeah, a success in my book. Um, I can also, uh, show you a bit here, um, like uh, 
uh, scale up the inference a bit. So here we only requested one prediction prediction at a time. But uh, I also um, I will also show you when we request multiple predictions at once. So here I have the YAML for the uh, inference service, uh, Triton inference uh, server, and uh, reading from this uh, storage URI. And uh, there, this is the, the job file. So this is job file for uh, for requesting predictions. I built a, a Python script and put that in an image, and I will request inference for uh, one of these uh, 100,000 jets at a time. So. This will be then replaced by, by the name of the file containing 100,000 jets. Uh, and then it uh, reads from this uh, URL on Kubeflow. Uh, and the script that will run, uh, we will do this, uh, we'll create five jobs uh, for in total then 500,000 jets. Uh, and these are then running in parallel. Uh, so it, what it does is it uses this job template that I showed earlier, replaces the root file with the, with the with the name of the file, and then cube control control create uh, from this directory uh, five jobs. And in these terminals, then I run the command uh, to create the jobs, and then um, on the right side you see the the pods uh, that are uh, as they are created. So five jobs are created. We see this. Uh, these uh, Kubernetes jobs here. And uh, yeah, so it takes some time to then load the data in the formats that's required for, for serving. And then also uh, it will take uh, some additional time to, to do the predictions for 100,000 jets each. So now we see the predictor being scaled up here to facilitate the incoming requests. Um, the pods are initialized, running. Uh, so now we have then one uh, predictor pod per uh, requester pod in this case. This is how I set up the, the uh, inference server. So as you can see then, uh, it scales up well uh, according to incoming uh, requests. And now they are starting starting to complete and this will then also shut down in, in, a, in a bit. All right, that was it for the demonstration. And let's continue on with the slideshow. Uh, so uh, these are the results we got when we actually used, or when we analyzed analyzed the results, we see a 10% improvement in energy resolution. So the ratio towards, uh, from the model towards the, the baseline non-machine learning method. And in addition, we also see uh, an improve, factor three improvement in, in so-called flavor dependence, meaning that the, uh, these energy corrections are more flavor independent or like uh, flavor here means uh, the flavor of the quark for example so there are different uh, uh, jets originate from different types of, of particles here we have up down strange charm uh, bottom quarks as well as the gluon um, and uh, uh, these energy corrections using deep learning are more independent of the jet uh, flavor uh, than the non-machine learning method. So it was uh, really a success to use deep learning for this application. All right, uh, I will now give over the floor to Dayan again. Let me stop no. share. All right, now you should be able to share. Sure, yes. So can you see it? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, okay, we're already here. Okay, so uh, a little bit about the challenges that we had uh, during the demo implementation. So the first one was to find the correct version of the Triton server image to, to actually serve the model. Uh, so it took some time to, to figure figuring that out, but then it worked in the end. Uh, then we had to do some TensorBoard uh, customizations. So we had to customize the TensorBoard controller to uh, pick up uh, an S3 uh, secret so that we could uh, uh, keep our um, TensorBoard uh, directory on a, on a, or a, like a path on the, on the S3. So we had to do that uh, ourselves uh, or to use kubectl edit on the deployment, which uh, was not uh, really convenient. Uh, then um, when uh, we were running uh, cut jobs, uh, 
we were using std out matrix initially and uh, that wasn't great because sometimes the model logs um, provide something that uh, looks like metrics but actually isn't metrics and then uh, we couldn't really uh, we would get some uh, random result so a better option is to use a file metrics collector for sure uh, and then ui uh, maybe katib's ui could be a bit better suited for multiple metrics but uh, those are pretty much minor things we didn't have any major challenges to implement this this very nice pipeline that daniel has shown so uh, that was that was quite nice uh, some of the improvements that maybe i would like to uh, suggest or uh, discuss uh, for example recently we uh, we had an idea and maybe somebody knows more about that than than myself but uh, yeah feel free to offer your opinions and thoughts uh, so if we have um, uh, a kubeflow instance on premise and then we have another kubeflow instance on gcp or on aws for example and uh, we want to offer our uh, users the same experience and we want we don't want users to create profile every time they go to a new kubeflow instance is there any way to do this profile replication across multiple clusters so essentially to migrate information about profiles such as names or pod defaults or resource quotas or default limits uh stuff like that so it would be nice to have some kind of a database or a shared storage where we could uh, store all this information about uh, profiles and then just uh, import it whenever we deploy a cluster on on another uh, on another platform so that this would be a very nice feature for for us uh, maybe it exists so if something like that exists feel free to to share uh, the next one uh, there is already ongoing work to make uh, pipelines namespaced because at the moment everybody can see everybody's pipelines which is not uh, ideal of course runs are uh, namespaced which is good uh, but uh, it would be great if pipelines would be namespaced as well and there is ongoing work there so that would be quite nice uh, and then the last one is to have a limit range resources to to add them to the profiles because there is a resource quota uh, CRD that we can set in every profile, but this, uh, the resource quota requires that we set resources to every pod that we deploy and uh, very often users will not do that. Uh, and uh, that's why we need limit range to uh, set default resources and limits for every pod. Uh, and currently, from my understanding, this doesn't exist, and it would be great to pair that up with the with the resource pool. Um, So yeah, those are those are the things that I wanted to uh, offer. So uh, to conclude, um, I, if we go back to the CERN's mission to improve the the knowledge of our the hum the knowledge of humanity about the universe uh, through studying the subatomic particles, we can see that machine learning can ha help us get there. And uh, we can see that uh, with uh, the jet energy uh, regression example, we have managed to uh, improve our results. Uh, then um, going further with that, we see that Kubeflow can help run machine learning uh, workloads uh, to scale uh, trainings and the serving and the other workloads. And uh, we have seen uh, that uh, in this demo, we have seen an excellent uh, uh, mutual integration of different components. We have seen uh, pipelines, CATIB, uh, training operators, case server, everything working together. And uh, we really like that uh, with Kubeflow, we have customizable and reproducible environments. And it has been very well accepted in CERN uh, community for now. So thanks everyone for your great work and effort uh, with Kubeflow. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to, to reply.